Today on All Across Oregon, we're heading back to the charming town of Grants Pass, Oregon. There we'll find New York style bagels, a super cool distillery, poke bowl, an inspirational potter, and meet some furry new friends. Grants Pass, here we come. This episode of All Across Oregon is made possible in part by John Waracoy, CPA, tax professional and profit builder in Southern Oregon and Northern California. Fire Mountain Gems and Beads, located in Grants Pass, Oregon, with over 50 years of providing jewelry making supplies worldwide. You can find them at firemountaingems.com. And Travel Southern Oregon. Travel Southern Oregon supports a diverse, thriving, and sustainable visitor economy to create a better life for all our region's residents. Visit Southern Oregon, do something great. Grants Pass, so many things to do here. There's art, culture, vineyards, great restaurants, distilleries, so much history, and it's the gateway to the Illinois and Applegate Valleys. And of course, the beautiful, majestic Southern Oregon coast. We start our day at a family run bakery with a husband and wife team that not only make great pastries, but what? New York style bagels? So here we are. We're downtown Grants Pass at Dash Bakery. I want you to meet Doug and Ashley, the owners and operators of this delicious place. Are you ready for some coffee? Am I ready? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody needs a cup. This is a latte here made with organic espresso from locally roasted Malello. Ooh. Our niece, Alex, makes these cups for us. What? Yeah, she's a local potter. Well, Vinny, you want to grab uh, that bottle of icing on the counter over there? Very nice. This is the best part. Get oh, all the goods. And we make this cream cheese icing. We make the dough. Orange. These are orange flavored. Do you know what's happening in my mind right now? Do you know? Do you know? All right, this is the these best part, These are beautiful. Part, okay, this is the best part. Wait until you see underneath here. Oh, yeah? See all that goo? Oh, look at that. Look at the stickiness. That is super, super fluffy, super popping out of my mouth. I don't even know what to say right now. That's our thing. That's what people come in for. For this? Yeah. For the cinnamon rolls? Cinnamon rolls and bagels. How do you balance that? So it's, it's perfectly balanced. You got to care about the food. When you think about your bakery though, it's yes. not just about all the sweets. No, no, we're not just a sugar bakery. We also do homemade New York style boiled bagels, the real way. No New skipping anything. New York style bagels. Minus the water. Look at this, look at this. <laughs> New York. Yeah, using Grants Pass water, obviously. But. Yeah. Let's see a New York style bagel uh, here in Grants Pass. Like? Oh, it's like being back home. Yeah, well, it's, I usually get in trouble. We'd like to much. do a big, thick New York schmear on our bagels. What inspired you to do the New York? When the business started it, we were kind of opening it as a, just a bread bakery. As mm -hmm. you know, this town is tough. Mm -hmm. And when your customers come in and say, $5 for a loaf of bread, it pretty much ended right there. So we adjusted our business to what this area needed. And we don't have a bagel shop in town. We're already doing all this baking. He loves to bake bread. So we're like, let's let's branch out. Let's try bagels. He started researching and he was like, if we're gonna do bagels, I'm not gonna steam them in the oven. I'm gonna do it the real way. I'm gonna boil them. So we get out our kettles, he boils them, throws them in the oven, bakes them at almost 500 degrees. So real hot and steamy in here. This is our favorite. It's the lox bagel. It doesn't get more traditional than that. Oh my goodness. And we use a, a Nova cured lox. It's got some lemon zest, some parsley, some dill, capers, red onion, thin sliced tomato. Wow, hope you guys are hungry. Looks good. Uh, what a nice bagel. Oh, and I love the capers. I love the salt from the capers. Red onion is my favorite. Oh yeah. You got the cream cheese to settle some of that saltiness. Mm-hmm. Yep. I haven't had a bagel like that since I was back in my hometown of Porchester, New York. 
So tell us again what happened. So yeah, after meeting here and I mean falling in love, we got married. We have three beautiful children. Yeah. We both had worked in restaurants and knew that was something we wanted to do. And we decided if we're gonna do a restaurant, we wanna make sure that we get our time with our kids because nightlife restaurants, it's very hard and you're Brutal. very married to it. So we wanted to have something where we could work our kids hours. Yeah. And so we settled on the bakery and coffee shop and, and then we moved back home had another baby <laughs> and started this business yeah, and we started, started this business the, the baby around in her front pack. yeah our youngest was three, three months, months old, old and i would wear her in a front pack while we were making coffee and frosting cupcakes and he was making sandwiches and baking bread this is what it's all about oh, yeah. yeah and the fact that you changed what you did to accommodate your kids oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and go into the, into the daytime. That's really what it's all about. We are so family focused. Our yeah. family lives here. We have a family business. We welcome kids. We welcome people to sit outside with their dogs. Sure. Yeah, and now our girls are 17, 15, and 12, yep. and we've got them in here working with us during the summertime. And it's good training for them. They're seeing us work really hard. They're coming in here. They're working hard. They get paid, and they are learning that you go to work, you grind it out, and you take care of yourself, but you have a good time while you're doing it, and you can enjoy yourself even though you're working hard. Well, you know what? You guys are a beautiful couple <laughs> inside and out. Oh, we and, appreciate and it. And what a, I am so glad I heard about you and it's was awesome. able to come here. Yeah. And the food is off the chart. Thank you, thank you. The bagel, I haven't had a bagel like, I don't even know. Appreciate I mean, I moved out from New York like 20 something years ago, and I haven't had that was incredible. That's our best compliment. When we can impress an East Coaster, especially New York or Jersey, and they come in and they say, your bagels, I haven't had one of these since I've been back over there. Yeah. That's what we want. That's what we want. That is a, that's exactly yeah. what you want. Oh yeah. <laughs> For sure. Best compliment. Go see the people at Dash Bakery and get the bagel with the locks. Mm. Now you're in for a treat. This little lady inspired me. Meet Alex. She's the one who made those cute little coffee mugs. So I tell you what, I, we were over at Dash Bakery, and that's your aunt and uncle. I, I said, these are just like the neatest mugs. They're so cool. And, okay. and she says, my niece makes these things. But we had to see the person behind it and what you do. So tell me about yourself. Tell me about what you do in this. And you work from home. I do. Um, I mostly make mugs because that's what people like. Um, but I make, I can make pretty much anything on the pottery wheel. What? How did you start pottery? Like, how does someone say, "I'm gonna buy a 2,200 degree kiln and and do something"? Well, I actually started an event. It was uh -huh. a fundraising event yeah. um, called Soup for the Soul, and it was handmade bowls. Um, and you would come to the event. You get a bowl and you get to eat soup from local restaurants and all the money went to the food pantry here the rock so i actually decided to learn to do pottery for that event i created so you started this from helping other people the first event i did i didn't do pottery yet and i had a hard time getting the bowls donated so i was like well for next year i'll just learn myself so that's kind of what i did i'm gonna make my own bowls yeah i mean really yeah. come on how cool is that did they already go in the kiln nope so they're gonna get hand, they're gonna get trimmed, they're gonna get cleaned up and painted. I'm gonna put handles on them. They're gonna go in the kiln once and get fired, and then they're gonna come out and get glazed and then go back in. So it's a, it's a multi-step situation. I mean, this is your ding right here. This is the pottery wheel, yeah. Alex, what would you like to make today? Tell uh, me. I'll make a bowl because I actually never get to make bowls. Yeah, let's do um, a bowl. I haven't, let's do a bowl. I haven't made a bowl in a really long time. Let's do a bowl. So the first thing I do is center the clay, which is a process of pulling it up and down and getting it nice and even all around. Gosh, you guys make that look so easy. That's it's the hardest part, definitely. So now I have a good foundation to start with. Just go in the center. This is like the coolest thing ever. It's not that easy, just so you know, it's not easy. This is like the quickest part of the whole process. As you see, like everything's always in I always have yes. so many steps and everything's always in a process somewhere. <laughs> like it's a big, it takes me probably a week or so just to get something through and done. But this is the funnest part for sure. I've probably made like a hundred thousand things. I Seriously? Probably, honestly. I thought about it the other day and I was like, you know, I've thrown tens of thousands probably of things on here. Who eats out of a bowl this big? Me. This is, the, this is a food bowl. I eat out of a huge bowl. How big is your spoon? <laughs> Not big enough. A little swirly. Look. 
it's done. It so <laughs> you look, you make it look so easy. Yeah, you cut it off, and I like to pick them up, set them down. Are you ready to try? I failed really bad last time. Well, so okay. that's what pottery is about failing. Okay. I mean, it's okay. like fifty percent failure. See, so like to make sure it's nice and stuck. Get the clay wet. Start okay, the wheel, fine. Start and I'll help you out. Okay, a little too fast. Too fast. Too fast. Too fast. Okay, now you wanna go. Keep going. This is the hardest part. Like, oh, this. so I didn't even get it centered yet. No, this is what takes. Oh, that's what you're trying to do. This is what takes the most practice. Okay, now you can stick your fingers in it and just try to do what I did. I gotta push harder without trying to. Oh wow, you're really pushing hard. Okay, got it. Okay, now I'm gonna try to pull it up. <laughs> Keep going. I got you. <laughs> you're gonna fire me. This is not easy. It's not. This is like super humbling, okay? Humbles me every day. Thank you. Thank you. For the lesson. And trust me, you are you are probably an amazing teacher, but I tell everybody I'm an awful student. So I... it's obvious. <laughs> so it gets to around 2200 degrees and it takes roughly nine to 12 hours to cook and then about the same amount of time to cool down. So it's like- Wait a minute, nine to 12 hours at 2200 degrees. It slowly builds up to that. So once it hits temperature, it turns off mm -hmm. and then it um, cools okay. down. Got it. Yeah, so it starts at room temperature and over the course of nine to 12 hours, it, it goes up and up and up and up slowly. Yeah. And then the last 100 degrees takes a really long time because it's a lot of energy. And so, I mean, it's like max energy that my whole house can take. <laughs> All right, well, you guys, get ready for 2,200 degrees. We'll see you in 12 hours. Not really. Okay. Voila. Look at that. This is after, so this is like 12 hours later. And what's a trip? It even has paper already with all the numbers written on the inside of it. <laughs> it's already skewed and ready to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it even melts the skew in there. Yeah, That's it does it all for me. It's but amazing. This, you are so talented. And thank you. I really, Alex, thank you for just sharing a few minutes of the day because this is a, when I saw him, I, I told you I had to come, I had to come meet you and Aww. see your work, so. Well, I'm honored yeah, to thank show you. you guys. Super thankful. And the coffee, just so you know, guys. Hey. The coffee tastes super good out of these mugs. Man, that process is so cool. And I even got to leave with a new favorite mug. Now we're heading down the street to Steam Distillery. Do you enjoy high-end bourbons, gins, vodkas? I want you to meet these two guys, owners and operators of Steam Distillery. This is Scott and Michael, and let's see what they got going on at Steam Distillery on G Street. Can we just see how, how it works back here? Yeah. I'll follow you. I'll so what he's got right now going is making a pumpkin spice uh, vodka. So what we do, what we do with these, this is called the Soxit Extractor. Um, and the idea behind it is anytime we want to do a new flavor, we can do something in here and try it. It's quick. This will be done in like 45 minutes. So what happens, this filled with vodka, it gets boiled, the vapors come up this bigger tube, hits the, the, the glycol system, condenses back to a liquid, and you can see it's rising up on this small tube. Once it hits up here, it's going to siphon back down into here. Does that over and over and over again until it pulls all those. This will be completely white when it's done, and this will be this color when it's done. So we do them like this, play with it until wow. we get the flavors dialed in. If we like it and we're going to do bigger batches, I've got this one here, which is just a you know six liter version, so I can do bigger. And that's what we use a lot of for most of our flavors that are up there. Then we blend that with our vodka to make our flavored vodka. So. Okay, so sampler. This is where we're sampler, this is where start we're to figure out what it tastes like. We, we like what we find out. We like what we have now. We like this. We dial it in with that. Then we go to bigger for stuff that we're just going to pour behind the bar here. Okay. We do it in this. This will produce a gallon and a half. It'll last us a month or two. It depends on what, what, which one it is. If, we, if it's something we're going to sell at the liquor store, like our habanero, our vanilla, our lavender, okay. lemongrass, I've got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got the big daddy here, same thing, that goes on, goes on top of the, that 100 liter still right there. 
So how do you, would you guys get together and say, hey, look, I got like a science degree or something, no. let's do this? The thing with distilling in the United States, you know, you can brew beer at home. You can make wine at home. As soon as you put that beer or wine through a distillation process, it's federally illegal it, everywhere in the country. It's from old prohibition laws. So I got myself a unit and practiced the theory of distillation in my garage because you can't actually distill got anything. It. So I made a lot of distilled water. So right now we're doing bourbon. We're doing bourbon. But you know, to be bourbon, it has to be a minimum of 51% corn. And then everything else, it has to be 100% grain. But 51% of it has to be corn. Then you can use whatever other grains you want. We do, I do um, corn, six row barley, and rye. Like Scott was saying, yeah, in this vessel here, um, we make our vodka out of a long grain rice. And we chose, we played around with it for a long time. So you can see it bubbling away in there. And you can actually dip your finger in and taste it. You can taste the sweetness of that, of that uh, well, depending on how much it's fermented off. But. Put my finger in it? Yeah. Oh yeah, sweet? Yeah, yeah the, the yeast hasn't eaten all the sugar yet. I just, I just put it in uh, last week, I think it was. So it takes about 10 days to, to fully ferment out. So we're halfway through the process? About halfway through the fermentation process, and then I'll start doing 25 gallons of time running through this. Let's like see some of this finished product. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Damn. My head hurts. So I'm gonna make the smoked old fashioned. It's our number one drink by far. Um, it is the one that uh, it has a bit of a show to it. So what we make it with is uh, first one orange and one orange dough cherry. Simple syrup. I don't think there's anything simple in this place. <laughs> a little bit of chocolate bitters. Then we use Buffalo Trace because we don't have our own, and Buffalo Trace is a, is a you know, it's a favorite. I see where you're going. There's your smoker right yep. there. So yes, we use a smoker. We use applewood chips. There we go. Let's see what it looks like. I, I can do it. You can do it. I do it. Yep. Look at that. Oh, that app, that is. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. That's like, I'm at the barbie, I'm at my campfire right yeah, now. Like Carrie Stew, that smokiness with the sweetness? Mm. Absolutely. That is the most flavorful drink I have ever had. It's got a lot of flavor in it. And that smoke is just perfect at the end. This is our maple bacon Manhattan. So we first start with one of the ice around ice cubes here. Um, Old Forester uh, whiskey, but we let it sit in uh, in bacon grease for a week, um, and then we freeze it, and then we strain it off. An ounce of maple, actually, we want to use 100% maple syrup, a little bit of orange bitters, strain it, and then to top it off, we take the bacon, and we use this gun again. We cook the bacon just a little bit more. Maple bacon Manhattan. Yes. So, nice. Yeah. Look at that. All right. Man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Now, while we were there, they had Dustin come in, the owner of the restaurant next door, and make us a fresh hokey bowl. It went perfect with our drinks. So we're gonna make an ahi bowl real quick. A little rice. We do uh, lime juice, agave, zest, and mirin in our, in our rice. We take our ahi uh, loin, Diced up, take a little bit of soy sauce, give it a mix. So some marinated uh, Ooh, red cabbage. Red cabbage. So is this your recipe? Did you figure this one out or do you just yeah, it's not too kind bad. of work with it? Keep huh? it simple. Don't it mess is? it up. Freshly shaved carrot. Well, I know how busy you are and you came in to make this. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much, Pleasure. man. What a couple of nice and fun guys. Great hospitality and we learned a lot. Now, let's head over to the Rogue Valley Humane Society and meet some hardworking people and volunteers that try to help the ones who can't help themselves. And today I brought my daughter Sophia with me, hoping to find a friend for my grand puppy that lives with her. So the Rogue Valley Humane Society was started in 1965 by a group of animal loving folks. Um, over the years we have grown and developed um, and now we're at this lovely beautiful property. It used to be an old dairy farm. Um, this is an old dairy farm, so you kept the whole place? 
Yes. The whole the whole yeah. piece of land. Yeah, the whole piece of land is ours. So the field area where it used, they used to have their cows um, is now our dog runs area. Um, up here uh, at the top of our hill, we've repurposed the original farmhouse into our surgical clinics. It's a lovely place to have animals wait for their forever home, and we're ha lucky to be here and come to work every day in such a beautiful environment in such a beautiful Southern Oregon. Did you say forever? Like fur? For for forever for, like, homes. For fur. Fur. Yes. Forever homes. Yeah. Fur on your shirt. <laughs> I like that. Well, let's go see some animals. All right, well, we're gonna start going through our dog kennels and meet a really special little guy, and Lydia's gonna tell you yeah. all about him. Um, so we're gonna meet Boots and Joey. They are 10-month-old uh, brothers, and they're Border Collie blends. I love how loud it is, it's beautiful. This is great. This is like, this is like my work. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. How do we know like they get along with that because you've already had them with other the dogs? Yeah, so we have the opportunity to do play group with certain dogs. Look how quiet they got already. Yeah. I am a dog whisperer. <laughs> they just stop. Just out of curiosity, I'm here, I'm looking, there's not a lot of dogs right now. Is that because? Yeah, so right now we are actually dealing with a situation where we had to take on a group of 10 puppies. So we are sharing some staffing in our puppy room, taking care of those puppies along with our dog staff. So we focus a lot on capacity for care at the Humane Society. So we're not gonna fill all 20 of our kennels at full capacity, plus have puppies and just have the two staff members a day that we have. We wanna focus and make sure that we have enough time to spend with each animal and give them what they need. So as far as the adoption process goes, the first step is someone just making it down here to see uh, if they find a good connection with the dog or cat that they're interested in. Um, a lot of times people will fall in love via a picture. So we have staff and volunteers as well taking really nice photos and videos of our animals to showcase their personality. Um, so as soon as someone falls in love, um, what we want to do is have them meet the animal. Sometimes seeing isn't always the same thing as connecting. Yeah. So we want to make sure they establish that connection and a bond so that we know that, that their um, relationship in the home will be successful. Well, Sophie, you ready to see if you connect with an animal? <laughs> you want to see if you connect with Joey? Yeah. Come on, Joey, you want to go out for a minute? Let's go, Joey, you want to go for a walk? Was Joey, uh, was Joey uh, surrender too? Yes, him and his brother were both surrendered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Boots and Joey uh, both came from kind of a sad situation. Um, when they came to us, they didn't even know what a toy was. Um, and so it took them a couple weeks to kind of realize that um, they get to play and they get to cuddle and they get to have these things that, you know, dogs typically get. Yeah, they didn't get that uh, previously, so. Oh man, well you know what? There's another puppy named uh, Murphy <laughs> that you guys would play so much you'd be exhausted. Now, we gotta go see the puppies. We gotta go see the puppies. So right now we have about 10 puppies in house. We have them in a totally separate area from our adult dogs for disease transmission purposes. Um, because they're babies, they do have a lower immunity and we wanna make sure that they don't get exposed to anything that um, we don't want them to get exposed to. Oh my goodness. Do they all look the same? Are they from the same litter? Yes, um, so they're a Staffordshire blend um, sort of puppy. Um, they're all about 10 pounds now, about a couple months old. You are gonna make a lot of people very happy. So we do wear personal protective equipment um, to help. I am so ready to play with the puppies. This is like every guy's dream. Oh, this is like, this is amazing. This is a puppy. Okay, everyone needs to have a puppy pylon. There's nothing like it. When people do find out that though, that that's their blood, is that an issue? Even at that age, like they have that, that people in them? Um, sometimes people will have misconceptions about these kinds of dogs and we do our best um, to educate them on why it, that's a little incorrect. Um, we don't, we believe there's only bad owners, not bad dogs. I'm with you hundred percent. I just can't believe, guys, they are so thick. They are so thick. They're like picking up a little bowling ball with fur. Now we're going to go up and see the surgery center in the old barn. In our old farmhouse. So this is our surgery clinic that we have on the Humane Society property. So okay. we have a veterinarian and a vet tech on staff and two days a week we provide surgeries not only for our animals and the TNR clients that we work with but also to other local shelters and rescues in our area. Yeah, so this table is our prep area. So when the animals get induced for surgery, 
they come out to the table, um, we trim their nails, we put eye drops in their eyes because their eyes are open during surgery, we don't want them to dry out. We shave their belly if they're getting ready to get spayed and sanitize the area mm -hmm. for the doctor. Um, and then we're also at the same time monitoring their breathing and their heart rate to make sure the anesthesia is working. It's like our own mini vet hospital up here. We just do a lot of spays and neuters. <laughs> wow. Well, everybody, thank you for letting us invade your space and thank you for your hard work and all the love you have for these animals. That's it's, uh, you definitely made my day. Thank you so much. I know you probably made their day too. So thank you. Thank you for having us. So if you're looking to get a dog or if you're looking to go get a puppy or a cat or a kitten, please visit your local humane society, your local animal shelter. There's so many that need help. And yes, if you're wondering if we added another fur baby to our family, this is Boots, but he'll be staying with Sophia. This was such a fun day. The people, the food, the animals, the city of Grants Pass just keeps on giving. If you're in Grants Pass, Oregon, or traveling up and down the I-5, go get a bagel, pick up a new mug, adopt an animal, visit these hardworking people. And until next time, we'll see you as we go all across Oregon. This episode of All Across Oregon is made possible in part by John Warakoy, CPA, tax professional and profit builder in Southern Oregon and Northern California. Fire Mountain Gems and Beads, located in Grants Pass, Oregon, with over 50 years of providing jewelry making supplies worldwide. You can find them at firemountaingems.com. And Travel Southern Oregon. Travel Southern Oregon supports a diverse, thriving, and sustainable visitor economy to create a better life for all our region's residents. Visit Southern Oregon. Do something great.